In today's lesson, we're going to look at alternative energy resources. The first aim is evaluate the use of biofuels as an alternate energy resource. Then evaluate the use of hydrogen fuel cells. And then finally, explain how we can measure the energy content of fuels. That's a practical investigation. Now, for some reason, humans have got themselves into a really bad habit of burning the fossilised remains of ancient fish and plants, also known as fossil fuels. The problem with burning fossil fuels is, one, they're non-renewable, they will run out because they take millions of years to form, and we're using them at a rate which is far faster than their rate of formation. But also, they release harmful pollutants. And what's remarkable, there's so many other options out there, so why aren't we using them? Well, here we'll look at three alternatives to fossil fuels and we'll evaluate them, the pros and cons of each. First up is the biofuel, biogas or methane. This is when we use microorganisms to decompose either animal waste or dead plants to produce a gas called biogas or methane. We can then light that gas to provide energy for central heating, warming water or even to power a turbine to produce electricity. What's also really clever about this system is plants obviously take in carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis while they're alive, and when we burn them, it releases that carbon dioxide. This is what we call carbon neutral, because the carbon dioxide released when burnt is also offset by the fact that it takes in carbon dioxide when it's alive. So overall, there's no net release of carbon dioxide. Now this is important because we know carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and therefore is linked to global warming. So now let's look at the pros and cons, and this could easily be a six marker in a chemistry paper. Firstly, obviously, things like manure and plants are renewable, so it's very easy to ensure we never run out. For example, if we use crops, it's very easy to replace them with other crops which grow very quickly. As I've already said, it's carbon neutral strategy because the plants re release carbon dioxide when burnt, but when they're alive, they will take in carbon dioxide. So there's no overall release of carbon dioxide, carbon neutral. It's a relatively clean fuel with very few pollutants being released, so very low amounts of sulfur dioxide or nitrogen dioxide, which can cause acid rain. And obviously manure and plants are pretty cheap, so it's cost effective. But there are some disadvantages. For one, if we're growing crops for fuel, then there's less land to grow food. Now, you may be aware that we're in the middle of a population crisis, so we do need more food to feed our growing population. So this is basically traded off against uh, our need for fuel. So I've drawn a little tug of war here between a mouth for food and fire for burning fuels. Which one is more important to us? And whenever you have to deal with a gas as a fuel, well, you need a large storage space. And also it's a very flammable gas, so that's a potential fire hazard there. We all know gases take up more volume than liquids or solids. So that's everything you need to know about biogas. Now let's look at another fuel. The next fuel is ethanol or bioethanol. This is another biofuel made from living things. Here we largely use the crop sugar beet or sugar cane, full of sugar, and we put one or the other into a fermenter with yeast. Now when yeast start to break down the sugar through the process of respiration, or rather anaerobic respiration without uh, any oxygen, they produce a product called ethanol, which you might commonly know as alcohol. Now you can mix this bioethanol with petrol. So if you put 10% ethanol and 90% petrol, you make a fuel called gasohol. Cars in Brazil run off gasohol. So here are the advantages and disadvantages of this scheme, and again, a potential six marker. One, gasohol means less crude oil is being used. Because now we're mixing it with ethanol, it means we don't have to use as much crude oil to make petrol. Two, again, because it involves the growing of plants, it's another potential carbon neutral strategy because they take carbon dioxide in through photosynthesis and release it when burnt. It's a relatively clean fuel as well, very few pollutants released, mainly just carbon dioxide and water. Now I realise these are greenhouse gases and linked to climate change, but they're a lot better than stuff which causes acid rain. Disadvantages are fairly similar, there's less land to grow food again, so we've got that trade-off between feeding ourselves and providing fuel for ourselves, because obviously we're growing crops on that land now for fuel and not food. Sugar beet and sugar cane, for example, require suitable hot climate to grow, so that restricts where we can use this as a resource. Also, after the fermentation process is over, there's still some impurities left in the ethanol, so we need to separate the ethanol from those impurities. 
We do that through a process called distillation where we heat it up and basically the ethanol gets separated out according to its boiling point. So distillation needed after fermentation and that uses energy. So that is how we evaluate the use of biofuels as an alternate energy resource. Now the hydrogen fuel cell is not a biofuel, it doesn't come from living things. But that doesn't mean it's not environmentally friendly, it's very beneficial to the environment, well potentially anyway. Let's see what you think. So you can think of a fuel cell much like a battery cell. However, batteries use toxic chemicals, and when you throw battery cells away, they can cause damage to the environment. Hydrogen fuel cells do not at all. Instead, we're just reacting hydrogen gas with oxygen gas. When the two react, they release energy and produce water. That's it. It's the energy that we use to power things, like cars. So one of the hugest benefits of the hydrogen fuel cell are that there are no pollutants, just water. Unlike batteries, you don't need to recharge them, you just need to make sure there's a constant supply of fuel. The hydrogen fuel cell is very efficient, that means there's very little wasted energy. In fact, hydrogen fuels can be above 80% efficient, that's phenomenally good. Take for example something like uh, how we get power from a power station. We have a moving turbine, so there's potential for energy loss through friction there. As the electrical power travels through the cables, through the national grid, we lose energy as heat. It's wasted as heat. Because there's so many stages and moving parts to how we generate electrical power normally, there's lots of potential for energy loss, so it can't be anywhere near as efficient as one simple cell as it has no moving parts and not different stages where energy loss can occur. So there's less energy lost through heat and friction. So admittedly, this sounds amazing. So where on earth could we go wrong with a hydrogen fuel cell? Well, once again, it's a gas. Gases require more storage space. It's an explosive gas, so it's hard to store safely. For example, if there was a crack and a gas leak, that could be very dangerous. But the real shame is we still need to use the process of electrolysis to extract the uh, hydrogen. So you remember the lesson uh, electrolysis where we basically electrolyze hydrochloric acid or water to produce the hydrogen. Now electrolysis, you may remember, is a very expensive energy demanding process. So we, we still need to burn fossil fuels to get that energy for electrolysis to separate the hydrogen out. So we still have this dependency on fossil fuels. And that's how you get six marks on evaluating the benefits and the costs of using the hydrogen fuel cell. So now we can evaluate the use of hydrogen fuel cells. So now we're going to look at how we measure the energy content in fuels using the calorimetric method. This is when we measure the energy content in fuel by heating water. So here I've got two fuels I want to test, fuel A and fuel B. The first thing I do is weigh one of the fuels. For that, I will need a top pan balance, what you might call weighing scales. So I'm going to take my fuel, I'm going to place it on top pan balance, I'm going to record down the mass. So I've weighed it and the mass is 34 grams. Notice how to draw a table properly. The independent variable always goes in the left hand column. In other words, what you change in the experiment. So I'm changing the type of fuel. And the dependent variable, in other words, what I measure, which is mass go in the next few columns. Also notice how I've put the units here, and by doing that with this little line here called the solidus line, that means I don't have to keep on putting units when I write numbers, because that says that all these are measured in grams. Next, I have to get a fixed volume of water in a beaker, so I'd use a measuring cylinder to measure water in a beaker, so it's a fixed volume that has to be controlled in this experiment to keep it a fair test. You then set up a draft shield. This can be anything, some sort of structure, which, which prevents any draft from blowing the flame away from the beakers, as this could stop the amount of energy being transferred directly to the beaker of water, and that would make it an inaccurate test as well. So now I put the thermometer in the water and allow it to reach the correct temperature, give it a few minutes to acclimatize, so I actually get an accurate reading of the water temperature. Once that's happened, I put the fuel underneath my beaker and I light it. Now what I'm hoping to observe is a temperature rise by 10 degrees Celsius. That's when I stop the fuel from burning or heating the water and I quickly blow out the flame. So light the fuel and heat the water by 10 degrees Celsius. When that's happened I take the fuel and I re-weigh it. And let's say this time it's 25 grams. So I burn, in other words, the difference of 9 grams of fuel. 
So in other words, it's taken 9 grams of fuel A to heat the water by 10 degrees Celsius. So now we do exactly the same with fuel B. Remember to replace the water here and then take the temperature again so you reset the experiment. And also make sure that you have a fixed volume of water, the same amount as last time, because if you put more water in there, it would take longer to heat up and that would be an unfair test. So let's take fuel B and weigh it and let's say that it comes to a mass of 42 grams. Then I take fuel B, I place it under the beaker and I light it. And once again I wait and observe for a 10 degree rise in temperature. When this happens I blow out the flame and I re-weigh the fuel. And this time the fuel has 37 grams of mass left. So in other words the difference is 5 grams. So which fuel contains more energy per gram? Don't misread the figures here, it's not the higher number. Remember what we're saying here is it only took 5 grams of fuel B to bring about a 10 degree rise in the water temperature. Whereas it took 9 grams of fuel A to bring about the same rise. So you needed less of fuel B to bring about the same temperature rise. So obviously fuel B has more energy in it per gram. Just remember the basic controls here. Fixed volume of water, make sure you're observing for a fixed temperature rise, and make sure you have a draft shield in place so the flame doesn't blow away from the beaker. So that is how we explain how to measure the energy content of fuels.